Hello, everyone. I'm Chris Thomas. You're watching ABC 10 Tonight. An animal rescue is facing accusations of animal cruelty. Then, in dollars and cents, how to get part of a $4 million settlement for a popular streaming service. And Discovery Park is getting ready for the Aftershock Festival. What you need to know. ABC 10 Tonight starts now. We start tonight with continuing coverage as Sacramento State tries to join the Pac-12 conference. ABC 10 made a public records request, and we now have a copy of the agreement letter for new members of the conference. That includes San Diego and Fresno State. It's a glimpse of what the future could look like for Sacramento State if they get in. ABC 10's Devin Truby has a closer look at the pros and cons. ABC 10 has obtained a copy of the agreement for new members of the Pac-12 through a public records request. It's for schools like San Diego and Fresno State, and it gives us a glimpse into the future of what things could look like for Sacramento State as they continue to pursue a position in the Pac-12. Going to the new Pac-12 conference will be a big commitment. According to the membership terms and conditions, schools are agreeing to be in the Pac from 2026 until June 30th, 2031, unless they negotiate a different date. Complete transformation in the position of the university to play in a major sports platform like the Pac-12. So I would actually prefer it to be longer. Should a school agree to be in the pack but leave before joining in 2026, the penalties are huge. Leaving for the Big 12, ACC, SEC, or Big 10 will cost $30 million. If a school doesn't become a member for any reason after entering the agreement, they owe the pack $40 million. We asked the SAC-12 committee, a group of local leaders spearheading the campaign, if this is concerning. SAC State has already done a FBS uh, study and gone through the process of evaluating all this stuff already. This is absolutely a set of rules that we can meet. There are several benefits. A school retains 50% of the revenue paid to the conference for college football playoffs, NCAA and NCAA basketball tournaments. It's an important business decision for Sac State. Being in the Pac-12 will allow us to be Title IX compliant. It'll allow us to pay for uh, the programs that are non-revenue. Currently, Sac State plays in the Big Sky Conference. According to the Big Sky Constitution, withdrawing with the proper one-year notice will cost $250,000. We need to pay it for it to happen. We will do it. Reporting in Sacramento, Devin Truby, ABC 10. Devin, thank you. We reached out to the Sacramento State Athletic Department for comment on the terms. They said they'd like to refrain from commenting at this time. A reminder, these terms could still change and schools can negotiate. An animal cruelty investigation is happening now involving a husky rescue in Nevada County. ABC 10's Alicia Machado has more on the charges the rescue's operators face and how the dogs are doing now. All the dogs need really great homes. We have lovely dogs here, all sweet, friendly. 33 dogs were seized at Motherlode Husky Haven, a Nevada County Husky rescue as a case of animal cruelty is under investigation. On a grand scheme, it was awful, but for the ones that were sick or injured, it was it was horrific. The operator of the rescue, 67-year-old Brady Fair, was arrested on October 6th and faces 33 counts of misdemeanor animal cruelty and one count of felony animal cruelty. This one was a rough one. What we encountered was a number of animals that were appeared very sick or injured. Um, clearly not having any type of treatment, suffering in the conditions they were being forced to, to endure. And on top of that, for the entire pack of dogs, lack of any shade, lack of appropriate food and water. Since the dogs were seized, animal control tells me two of them have died. The Nevada County Sheriff's Office says this all began at the beginning of the month when animal control received a complaint about someone owning 60 plus dogs found roaming on Banner Quaker Hill Road in Nevada City, a remote area of the county. Animal control noticed numerous violations and gave him 24 hours to fix them. Although the Sheriff's Office says improvements were made just days later, they say Fair was involved in a traffic accident where several animals were hurt and one was killed. Investigation will continue so charges could be added. 22 of the dogs are under the care of Sammy's Friends Animal Shelter in Grass Valley and ready for adoption. Absolutely adorable. Now we did reach out to the operator who was arrested, but he did not respond. The shelter says aside from adoptions, donations are the next best way to help. They accept monetary donations, food, blankets, and toys. Check out abc10.com links for more information.
Turning now to California's high gas prices, state lawmakers are expected to vote on new legislation by the end of this week. Those in support of the bill known as ABX 2-1 believe that it would lower gas prices. But tonight, Chevron tells us if lawmakers pass this bill, it would only drive the costs up. ABC 10's Jeannie Nguyen is here to break everything down. Alex, for months, state lawmakers, the governor, and oil refinery companies have been going back and forth, placing blame on one another for high gas prices in California. Tonight, I spoke with Chevron's president of America's Products, who just condemned the state's latest proposal and past policies. Measure has nine <laughs> yeses, uh, two no votes. It's out. On Monday, California's special session bill, ABX2-1, passed a Senate committee hearing calling for oil companies to maintain a minimum level of inventory to avoid price spikes. Chevron responded, sending this letter to Senator Stephen Bradford and Assemblymember Cotty Petrie Norris. I want to make sure that lawmakers understand the consequences of their decisions over the last 20 years and decisions that they're making going forward. Andy Walls, the president of Chevron's America's Products, who has been working for Chevron for the past 35 years, says his letter to California lawmakers is his way of telling them they're misinformed. Well, there's no place to put extra product. There's no tanks where the refineries are full, okay? What's happening is they've been shutting refineries because it's not a place where people want to operate or invest in in that business. California is directly trying to get us out of business and therefore there's no there's no longer the same amount of capacity. One of the main points discussed during the special session is preventing oil companies from price gouging, something Chevron says is ridiculous. If we were breaking the law anywhere, we would no longer be in business. That is a ridiculous statement. It's a politically motivated statement. It has nothing to do with facts. Senator Bradford and Assemblymember Petrie Norris would not provide us with an interview or statement about Chevron's letter. But on Monday, Bradford expressed his support for the bill, though he has reservations. Refineries are already obligated to meet these gasoline supply agreements during turnarounds. I fear many times that we're putting inventory quotas before safety and before real pricing. So uh, those are some of the concerns. Ultimately, Chevron, as stated in the letter this week, believes lawmakers should leave this decision to the experts. I think what they're doing is playing politics. They're trying to appease voters. And in fact, they don't want to work on the, ser the real problem. Now, in response to the letter, the governor's office tells ABC 10 in part, experts agree that prices spike when the industry fails to plan for outages and that this policy will save consumers billions adding that Chevron has not shown up to answer for themselves to the legislature, to which Chevron told us today they have been present and are speaking to lawmakers. Alex. Time now for Dollars and Cents, where I answer your money questions and help you navigate a changing economy. You might be getting some money back from a popular streaming subscri subscription. If a proposed settlement is approved, certain Peacock customers could get some cash. And the deadline to apply is just around the corner. But an expert I talked with explains settlements like these raise some important questions you'll want to ask yourself before you decide to cash in. This settlement is the result of a lawsuit filed last year, claiming some Peacock customers in California were charged for automatic renewals without the proper authorizations required in the state. According to this notice sent to customers, the court has not decided who is right. Peacock chose to settle this case without admitting liability, costing them nearly $4 million. You could get a piece of this money if you enrolled in an automatically renewing Peacock subscription directly through Peacock with a California billing address from September 15, 2019 through February 27, 2024. How can viewers know if it's worth it for them to participate and cash in on a settlement like this? First, you have to look at the dollar value. According to the notice, if you qualify, you could get about 18 bucks. Filling out all those forms and filling out a bunch of paperwork just to get that $18 is so tedious, is so cumbersome, is so time intensive. So ask yourself, is it worth your time? Some people will say, hey, I'll take the $18, you know, because why leave free money on the table? And that so-called free money will likely come at a cost. Uncle Sam, finance experts I talk with say that $18 is taxable income. So you'll be lucky if you get the full 18, which you won't, most right. likely. <laughs> <laughs> and I know you mentioned the lawsuit is about $4 million mm -hmm. or so. So where's the other money going? Yeah, a big shocker here. Most of the money 
goes to the lawyers. Uh, I meant that facetiously here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's why there's so little left for the remaining customers who get letters like the one I showed you. The deadline to apply is this Sunday, and this case isn't done just yet. There is a hearing on the final approval of the settlement set for November. To watch more of my dollars and cents stories, head over to ABC 10 Plus. You can find it under the news section. The app is available on Roku, Amazon Fire TV, and Apple TV. You can also email me your questions at lpainter at abc10.com. Well, changing gears now, the largest rock festival on the West Coast is back at Discovery Park tomorrow, and dozens of businesses are excited, to say the least. They're banking on thousands of fans spending money across the region. ABC 10's Roxanne Elias is live at Discovery Park, and Roxanne, what can folks expect this time around? Well, Chris, organizers tell us this is the biggest lineup yet with eight headliners and an addition of a fifth stage here for the first time ever in history, drawing thousands of people into these gates. The gates at this year's Aftershock Festival are preparing to open up Thursday at Discovery Park. We're going to be expecting 40,000 people a day, so 150,000 fans across the four days from all over the world uh, will be in Sacramento uh, for this year's uh, iteration of Aftershock. Businesses surrounding the festival say they're more than ready to welcome the fans. Something funny, the first year that uh, Aftershock happened a few years ago, we got killed by the number of uh, customers that came to visit for the first time. We, were, we didn't know what Aftershock was. So um, the second year we got ready and we love how it keeps getting bigger and bigger year after year. Enrique Valentino is the co-owner of Mezcal Grill in South Latomas, which is walking distance from the festival. He says the family-owned business now knows to prepare for the influx of customers. We get a report of how many new customers came in based on if they pay with a credit card. So it's anywhere from like 20 to 25 percent, uh, mainly uh, Friday and Saturday. Just up the road from Mescal Grill, the Northgate Boulevard business community also reaps the benefits of the four-day festival. Algo Bueno co-owner Marco Rodriguez says they wait for it every year. Locally, I think everybody kind of loves Northgate and they all love the, what we were providing stuff like that, but now we're also getting um, recognition from people outside of Sacramento. So we get a lot of visitors that are traveling, that they're staying in hotels here, they are either flew in, they drove in. And for the first time this year, Algo Bueno is staying open until midnight on Friday and Saturday. Rodriguez says the business is not only good for them, but for the entire city. Obviously you want to have more business, you know, you want uh, that uh, aftershock to coincide with your business to, and the positive impact, um, and just have people to to want to come and return to Sacramento. Back out here live visit Sacramento also tells me that the festival brings in an estimated $30 million worth of economic impact. So a lot of money coming into our city. I'm live in Sacramento, Roxanne Elias, ABC 10. And thankfully it comes just as the extreme heat has come to an end as well. Sounds good, Roxanne. Thank you for the live update. <laughs> tracking Hurricane Milton. Just look at this. We want to show you a live look at Florida as we speak. You can see those high winds and blowing rain as the storm approaches. We, as we mentioned earlier, live in the show, uh, several roadways have been closed to traffic because of this dangerous storm that is moving in. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, we have an impact alert for a different type of storm locally. Carly's also tracking some solar storms as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So let's bring us up to speed on what to expect there. The yeah. northern lights and everything, huh? Right. We had a great event in May, and now we're having something similar coming our way as well as we'll be looking to the sky. For those northern lights, the aurora forecast is here as we do expect to see that becoming a G4 potential storm system as we start looking at that making its way in tonight weak to nothing happening that is way up into the poles in Canada. But as we get into Thursday night into Friday morning as well, we'll be looking at it at number eight there. That's severe eight pushing almost nine to extreme. But that just means we're going to expect to see this pushing as far south as into Northern California and at least the best viewing areas will be mostly into areas of the Pacific Northwest. But that's the naked eye viewing we could see with the long lens exposure, especially if you want to just get your cameras out in the middle of the night, be able to even see them kind of bouncing around the sky as we see Northern California being exposed to that as well. So very similar to what we dealt with in May when we saw the Aurora viewing 
also making its way into Northern California. Now, the geomagnetic storm here, as mentioned, is expected to be severe, a G4, which could cause some potential power issues, mostly to satellite issues. But for us, as we take a look at this, this could just be voltage problem concerns, and it could be as seen as far south as North Carolina, Alabama, and Tennessee. Right now, though, we're looking in Sacramento at temperatures finally cooling off. And could this be the start of fall? I'm thinking so. Temperatures cooling down now, finally into the low 80s for Sacramento. Still a little warm. Stockton Modesto in the upper 80s. Mid 80s in Marysville, but we are far from the triple digits with 71 in Tahoe. As we look at uh, weather headlines ahead, that cooling trend will continue into the weekend and into next week. Now, a weak storm system with rain potentially could start making its way also into Northern California this weekend. We'll talk more about this in just a second, but we're also looking now at decreasing fire concerns. The winds are much lighter, the temperatures are dropping, and the humidity is starting to go up just a little bit more. So this is some good news. And finally, just a bit of relief for ourselves. Low pressure still up high in the Pacific Northwest, but it's that long trail that's starting to extend the clouds over Northern California. You've been seeing them today, and we'll continue to see some partly cloudy skies as we start moving closer to the weekend. Cooling temperatures as well, and right now some of the clouds overhead. Again, partly cloudy into tonight and tomorrow. Now viewing for the Aurora Borealis, you'll be in and out of those clouds as we move from tomorrow night into Friday morning, but you should be able to see something at least, especially if you have a long lens camera exposure there. Future winds about 15 to 20 mile per hour winds as they'll start moving in through the Delta each and every night. So nothing major in terms of big concerns for major wind events, but at least a cooling trend headed our way. As we take a look into the weekend, we'll start to see a bigger dip here into that uh, trough moving into Northern California into Saturday and Sunday. So good news as temperatures are expected to begin cooling down into the foothills, those mid to upper 80s for tomorrow. And our 10 day forecast does bring our temperatures from mid to low 80s to even potentially Saturday, the upper 70s and low 80s next week. We're also looking at some more low 80s and upper 70s returning to the forecast. And again, the shower chances for Saturday, that is the morning hours are expected to be about only 20% north of I-80. Oh, so we knew this forecast would come. Those <laughs> temperatures would be back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's more like it, huh? Yes, for finally. This time of year. Finally fall. <laughs> okay, Carly, thank you. Prop 4 is another borrow and spend package proposed by the state legislature. It's the same amount as Prop 2, a $10 billion bond, but Prop 4 would fund something different. A whole bunch of infrastructure and environmental projects, most of them tied to climate change. The biggest chunk, almost $4 billion, would be spent on water projects for drought, flood, and water supply, with lesser amounts for forest health and wildfire, sea level rise, land conservation, energy projects, parks, adapting to extreme heat, and helping farmers to respond to climate change. The spending plan for most of these categories gets broken down into specific types of projects, everything from building new power lines to shade canopies for farmers markets. Prop 4 has this list of categories of spending, but there's no list of specific projects. The exact projects that get all this funding would be decided by the state agencies that get the money once they have it. All you're deciding here is whether to borrow the money. Bonds are like taking out a big loan. Passing Prop 4 would commit the state to paying back those bonds, $400 million a year for 40 years. That's a grand total of $16 billion of taxpayer money over the long term to borrow $10 billion for this spending today. Prop 4 has no new taxes or any kind of plan to raise all that money, so it would be up to future lawmakers and governors to factor these payments into the budget for the next 40 years. A yes vote on Prop 4 would approve the borrowing of that $10 billion for the climate package of spending. A no vote rejects the measure. I want people to read this book and see themselves and see their experiences reflected in the pages that they read. ABC 10 was at American River College as she shared insights from her latest book and discussed what it means to be Latino in America today. The main message of you sound like a white girl or the thing that I want people to come away with is that I want them to walk into every room and feel like they belong there because they do.
Julissa encourages her readers to thrive in their own skin. To thrive in my own skin has really meant to be proud of where I come from, to be proud of my people, to be proud of my history. Julissa came to the U.S. as an undocumented immigrant from Mexico as a child. As she writes about her childhood, growing up, and eventually landing a finance job on Wall Street, she explores racism, hypocrisy, and the power of language, especially English. There is a passage in, in You Sound Like a White Girl where I write about my dad um, sort of shrinking every time that he spoke English. It really affected me, really made me feel like, what is this language that is doing that to my dad? After reading her book cover to cover, I wanted to ask Julissa more about how writing this book helped her heal. In some ways, yes, I am still on this healing journey um, because I think it never, it never really, um, it never really ends. You know, you kind of have to keep um, reclaiming all of these things that um, that sometimes you lose when you assimilate. And part of that struggle is with identity. Julissa writes about the complexities of identity and pulling back the curtain on what it means to be Latino. It's sort of said that Latino is an ethnicity, but not even all Latinos share the same culture, right? Um, even the words that we use to describe ourselves can cause controversy, right? Is it Latino? Is it Hispanic? Is it Latin? Is it Latinx? So the biggest thing about Latino identity is that we have to define it for ourselves. So it's, it's complex, but I think that there is a really beautiful thing about coming together as a community, um, even if we don't always agree on what our community should even be called. October recognized as National Disability Employment Awareness Month. What's the goal? Is to promote equitable access to good paying jobs for all people. That campaign started back in 1945, going from a week long celebration to a month. It also brings attention to the issues people with disabilities face. Let's get to ABC News Candace Red with more on this story and the event happening today. Hey, Candace. That's right. Good morning. Well, just like everyone else, people with disabilities want to earn a living too. But according to the U.S. Department of Labor, people with disabilities are less likely to be employed compared to people without a disability. That's why Pride Industries, it's a nonprofit based in Roseville, they're on a mission to bridge this gap in the workforce. Well, Pride is holding its second annual I Am Able Disability Job Fair today, and dozens of businesses, organizations, and agencies will be at the event to hire and work with people in the disability community. Well, the event also celebrates October as Disability Employment Awareness Month. It's an opportunity to call attention to one of the most underutilized talent pools in the country, and that is people with disabilities. The most common barrier to individuals with disabilities who are seeking employment is actually having the opportunity to meet with employers and to share their talents and their experiences. Well, we covered this event last year and it's so great. More than 600 people attended the event. This time it will be even bigger with at least 1,000 people expected. Well, volunteers will also be there helping anyone needed. Again, the job fair is today. It's gonna to be from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. at the Convention Center in downtown Sacramento. Such an underutilized pool of talent there. I'm glad that this is happening year after year and getting bigger and bigger. Candace, thank you. Well, just three years ago, the Oak Park Black Film Festival began. It's already receiving international recognition. The six-day film fest kicked off last night. And this morning, ABC students Mark S. Allen is live at the Guild Theater with the organizers behind the festival. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, good morning to you. First of all, one of the biggest stars of the show, the Guild Theater, take a look around. There is not a bad seat in the house. It was built in the 1900s, long before movies even had sound. Now they do have sound and people making a lot of noise about the Oak Park Black Film Festival because it's awesome. Adrian Hall, Drew Burks. Adrian, you are the creator, the developer, the CFO. Three years running, look at how it's blown up in that short time. Yeah, it's been incredible just in three years and already it's almost sold out every single night. Um, and we're just thrilled. We're thrilled to bring uh, producers, filmmakers from all over the country, even as far as, as England, um, to right here to Oak Park. That's awesome. We're going to get to the films in a minute. Uh, it also benefits a great cause, St. Hope's Academy. I want you to speak to that because when we talk about the theater being here a minute, like I said earlier, you've been here a minute. You were one of the original kids that benefited from St. Hope. Drew, take the mic and just tell us what St. Hope does and how it changed your life. So, I mean, what St. Hope definitely does is 
it builds the community and that's what it was all about in Oak Park. And for me to come back to the community and be able to be in this theater and put on these events that we do here in the theater, that's really what St. Hope is about, is bringing it back home. Always come back to your community to develop it. Awesome. And you bring it back home to this theater. He is also the director of the, the Guilt Theater, so loves the love I'm giving that. Now let's talk about the movies. So I love Chocolate with Sprinkles, this movie about donuts that's way more than being about donuts. Yeah, it is, and I'm actually, I haven't, I'm holding out because I haven't seen that one personally yet, so I'm going to watch it with everyone else and kind of get their reaction as, as it's shown. What I love about it, like there's a movie called Chef that John Favreau did, and it's not really about the mobile truck industry, it's more about a relationship with father-son. Okay. The same thing, this movie about donuts is going to move you, it's about this husband-wife relationship uh, and the relationship with the children, it's really beautiful. Um, also, you're going to see a lot of famous faces, there are all kinds of documentaries, one of which celebrating Luther Vandross, you're going to learn so much more about it. Yeah, absolutely. We're really excited to bring this documentary about Luther Vandross that's going to be debuting here, right here at the Guild Theater, um, before it's uh, shown and released uh, worldwide. Um, but yeah, Luther Vandross, what an icon. And so I think we're going to have a lot of people coming out for that one for sure. Awesome. Runs through Sunday. We can still get tickets. Where and how? You can go straight to Eventbrite, uh, look up the Oak Park Black Film Festival, um, and you can still get walk-up tickets for today and throughout the rest of the, the film series uh, through Sunday. Awesome. And by the way, the gentleman to your right, very funny, hysterical local comedian touring worldwide as well. So we're lucky to have you. Thank you for being here. Can't wait to see you. And uh, thank you again. All right. So celebrate black film. These stories are amazing. It is a celebration you need to be a part of. Back to you. Yeah, that oh, that Guild Theater wonderfully restored, as Mark mm -hmm. mentioned, over 100 years old. It's a beautiful place to see almost anything. Mark. Thank you. Thanks so much for watching ABC 10 tonight. We're here 24 seven on the free ABC 10 plus app. You can get your news and latest on Hurricane Milton as well. Anytime, anywhere. I'm Chris Thomas. We'll see you next time. Hundreds of thousands of policies canceled. Insurance here in the state of California is dysfunctional. People paying more for less. I'm completely not covered for any kind of fire that happened. The issue growing. People can't afford to have the most valuable thing they own. With no simple fix. This is a long-term game. We're in the midst of the largest insurance crisis that we've lived through. ABC 10 investigates California's home insurance crisis. Watch Thursday night on To The Point with Alex Bell.